Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now here's your host, Bruce Hutchins. This is a real treat for me because I'm with Marv Shear. He's the youngest of the Shear brothers and a good friend of mine who passed a few years back, Harry Shear, helped me get into hunting. And he's part of my, um, he was a hunting mentor for me and, and all his stories. So Marv, um, Marv lives in La Crosse, Wisconsin and hunts Buffalo County and has for a number of years. So I wanted to get Marv on the show and share his hunting tradition and all about hunting buffalo county welcome to the show marv yeah thanks for having me well it's a pleasure and, and let's talk about that hunting tradition and how you started off as a kid doing deer drives up at eddie and lester's along the buffalo river and all all other places that your dad took you to so let's talk about you know when you start hunting and and how all that uh developed yeah you know dad was was always been the big into hunting and fishing but uh you know he worked um, out of town Monday through Thursday, he gets home late Thursday night. And so Friday was usually, you know, his day to kind of catch up around the house, you know, vehicle maintenance, all that stuff. And then if we were really lucky, we got to do some hunting or fishing on Saturday. Um, but Sunday was really the day that, you know, was dedicated to the family hunting. And, um, so of course that was, was always a favorite, favorite day of most of us in the family. Even my sisters hunted, um, small game and, and they deer hunted and everything. But, um, you know, from before I could hunt legally, uh, you know, I tagged along with, with Gary and my dad and, you know, squirrels and, and, uh, we, you know, a lot of grouse around at the time. So we did some grouse hunting, rabbit hunting in the winter. And, um, you know, we ate a lot of wild game on the table and, uh, kind of grew up on that. Um, and so it just kind of, you know, was part of the family tradition. And, of course, had lots of relatives, aunts, uncles, cousins that hunted. Uh, so we always looked forward to, to gun season. Back then, nobody really bow hunted, um, but it was always about gun season and the anticipation of, you know, the gun season. And, you know, we didn't do a whole lot of scouting um, for deer, per se. It was kind of just went along with, with small game hunting. But, uh, you know, the weekend before gun season, we would go out and select our favorite rock. Uh, nobody really used tree stands back then, but select a favorite rock or a tree to sit by and, and just kind of wait for daylight opening morning. and and uh, good things happen from there. Now, um, where were you guys living uh, at that time? Uh, we lived in Hillsboro, a little town um, in Vernon County. Um, you know, again, a rich hunting tradition around there. Uh, it was pretty rare that somebody didn't do some form of hunting uh, in that area. So, Yeah, and then do you remember the deer drives that uh, we used to do? Because I first came and met your dad and, and Dick Rogers and all the, all the, all the family in 66 so yeah how old were you then well i was born in 62 so um you know i didn't start hunting until i was 12 but i you know again i was always really into it even before i could carry a gun myself so uh, i always enjoyed you know tagging along on the drives and stuff but you know i think typically what would happen with opening morning we would kind of all have our stand sites and, you know, you'd hunt till noon and then we'd go down to Lester and Rita's for lunch. And then, then the, the big group would form and, and pretty much from then on, it was deer drive. Um, and, and the groups you know, were pretty big, weren't they? They were 15, yeah, we 20 had people? Some pretty, pretty good sized groups, um, you know, 20, 25 people. Um, and, you know, it, it was different back then as far as getting access to properties, you know, neighbors let neighbors hunt and, you know, fence lines didn't mean as much as they do today. Uh, good or bad, but um, so we we didn't have any problem finding you know places to hunt, um, and you know we, we got plenty of venison because of it. So yeah, I can remember the the days after the drives and everything. We'd hang up all the deer, and then you know we'd go to work starting skinning them, or you know mm-hmm. you know a couple of, they'd let them hang for a couple of days. But I I just remember those meals and everything. And that, folks, that's part of the hunting tradition. That's part of my hunting tradition because you know that's that's where I started hunting and Harry was big on going out West, wasn't he? Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the year that he started going out there. I know Dick made several trips with him, even right up to when dad was, was, you know, diagnosed with cancer and was having a tough time getting around. But 
Um, you know, my mom went out a few times. She loved to antelope hunt. And uh, it, it was a pretty rare year that dad didn't go out uh, antelope and or mule deer hunting, um, rifle hunting. Uh, they, I think they started out in South Dakota initially, and then they started getting further west into into Wyoming. And I think Buffalo was Buffalo, Wyoming is where they finally kind of ended up planting their, their roots. And, and that's, you know, they hunted there many, many years. And we, as a family, we still go out there. Um, somebody goes out there almost every year. On well, rifle, aren't your brothers out hunting. there now, or aren't they going out for elk hunting? Uh, we are leaving on an elk hunt uh, in a week, a little over a week. Okay. Um, in so Wyoming. you're going along, yeah. too, with Gary and Jim? Yeah. Yep. Gary and Great. Jim and I, and then a, a mutual friend of ours. Uh, we've been trying to draw this elk tag for a few years. It finally took nine points, but we finally drew the tag, and we're pretty excited about it. So. Well, that's great. And, you know, yeah. um, what are some of your, your your memories back, you know, going back to when you first, you know, you first shot your first deer? Do you remember that? I do. You know, back then, um, it was four people per doe tag. So it was a party tag, and uh, any one of the four people could shoot it. But once that deer was, was shot, we were done with that tag. And so, you know, it was kind of a cherished thing. But I remember um, uh, hunting up on Lester's, and I know Eddie was in the area because somebody had kicked out a deer, and I think Eddie maybe shot at it first, and I don't remember if he hit it. But I do know it came by me, and I shot it. I didn't make a good shot on it, but we caught up with it and, uh, you know, got it uh, harvested and uh i was a pretty excited guy um you know I, I don't remember my age i probably was 12 or 13 either my first or second year of hunting um so that was pretty exciting but i didn't actually shoot a buck with my gun until i was 19 years old so i hunted hunted a few years um you know deer weren't as, as numerous then and um you know we just uh it, it just wasn't as easy it seems like as it is today but yeah i was 19 when i when i shot my first little basket rack eight pointer and I was pretty proud of that too. So. Well, yeah. Every every single deer, you know, I've taken is, is a trophy, and I know you guys, your whole family, feels the same way about that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And let's talk about, you know, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago about, you know, we didn't we didn't archery hunt. When did when did you start archery hunting? I sh- I'm a left-handed shooter, and my brother Jim had a right-handed recurve and and i probably shouldn't say this out loud but that's what i hunted with uh for a couple years in high school now luckily the deer were way smarter than i was and i didn't even i don't believe i ever got a shot at one even but uh me and a couple high school buddies we had a blast uh going out you know with our bows we thought we were pretty pretty good stuff back then because there again there wasn't a whole lot of people bow hunting at that time um and so that was kind of my my introduction if you will but I didn't really seriously pick up a bow until I got out of college and I started a job uh, and I met a guy, I was working side by side with a guy who actually was a, was a, um, went to a high school nearby us. And so we were both kind of big into sports and pretty competitive. Um, and we didn't really like each other that much until the first break of the morning, we went into the break room. We started work early. And so it was about nine 30 in the morning and and uh, like always, I picked up a hunting magazine and, uh, you know, he came over to me and he's like, Marv, you know, do you hunt? And I'm like, oh, yeah. And from that moment on, he, he was big into bow hunting. And from that moment on, he kind of took me under his wing and, uh, you know, it just got the spark started and, uh, you know, got got a different bow and, and uh, you know, got set up and, and we spent a few years hunting together, um, did some hunting over around Lester and Eddie's there and, and same thing I hunted for, I don't remember, maybe three, four years before I actually got a deer with my bow. Um, again, a nice little basket eight pointer, but I was sure proud of that, that deer. And, uh, from that point on, I just kind of gave up all other hunting. I just, um, as far as small game hunting, I just got so into bow hunting and just to this day, I just love it. Uh, like I did on day one. So yeah, you've, you've turned, uh, pretty good at it. I mean, um, you know, you, you, hunted hard and you know sitting around yeah. and, and chit-chatting with you um mm-hmm. you know it, it it's evident that you're a student you're, you're a true student of, of archery what are some of the lessons that you learned early that you're still applying today uh regarding archery hunting well this this gentleman that i'm talking about was also kind of big into target archery and so he was a great instructor on not only becoming a good hunter but becoming a good archer which i think 
is is very important because archery, you know, takes up a lot of time and money. And if you don't go out there with with a lot of confidence in your shooting ability, um, it it can really distract from uh, from your experience. And so he was a great mentor because, like I say, he was a good hunter. Um, we got along great, but he really, you know, focused in on the technical aspect of archery. You know, making sure your equipment was as good as you could afford, making sure it was tuned good. Um, you know, just really paying attention to those types of details. And um, so, you know, unfortunately, due to you know raising a family and time constraints, you know, I don't get out and shoot the 3D tournaments like I used to. But I get to a few every summer and and still really enjoy them. And you know, it to me a relaxing evening is in my backyard with a couple of 3D targets and you know, fling 30, 40 arrows and and uh, you know that's that's kind of my quiet time, my relaxation time. So now your your son's starting to hunt with you. Has he killed his first buck yet or doe? Yeah, both my sons. Actually, my oldest son is 23. My younger son is 21. They both have been very successful. Um, in fact, my younger son has kind of got a horseshoe. He's killed um, a couple bucks with his bow. You know, 20, 21 inches wide. Um, you know, really nice deer. He just seems to have that knack. Um, you know, a few years back, uh, he was still able to hunt uh, during the youth gun season. He hunted five times, and he, it, it was back when we could shoot more than one buck in Wisconsin with a bow. So he actually killed two bucks with a bow, one buck with a gun, and a doe each with his gun and bow. So, oh my he, goodness. He, yeah, he really, um, you know, he's patient, he's, he's a good hunter. You know, he shoots pretty well. And uh, so, yeah, both my kids are, are pretty accomplished hunters. Um, my older son gets into other types of hunting. He likes to water fowl hunt, too. So, you know, it's, he kind of has to split his time between some of those other sports. But but he, he too, enjoys, uh, you know, deer hunting, bow hunting. But, yeah, they both have, have been pretty successful in their in their young careers. Well, that's great. And were they over the hey, – ever able to go out west with harry and, and uh, antelope hunt no they haven't um i think pretty much all the other cousins um who are older than my kids have been able to go out at least once um there was the uh, one year the year before dad passed away he went out there with us and he was he was it was really a tough trip for him because he he was pretty much totally deaf and you know wasn't really able to get around very well but he wanted to go, and of course we wanted him to go. So we we actually took a separate vehicle out there just so you know if something happened, you know it would be easier to get around. And but there there was um, I, I don't remember the numbers, but Gary and Jim and I, and there was probably five of the cousins um, and my dad, and then this mutual friend of ours that went out. So we had a pretty good group. Um, and you know now now these younger uh, my nephews, uh, a couple of them actually three of them are going out to Idaho on a kind of do-it-yourself backpack rifle mule deer hunt. So uh, dad really, you know, did a nice job of planting that Western seed in us. Um, you know, obviously we're not going to be able to do it every year, um, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, just a, a neat thing that he did to kind of get that spark going in all of us. Yeah, I, you've heard me say this before, but, um, you know, he, he, he lit the flame in me and I, I've yeah. hunted, you know, quite a bit and it's all all due to your dad and, and the stories and and just the you know um the passion that he instilled so um, mm -hmm. you know i just yeah yeah i'm very thankful for that I, yeah yep exactly it's um yeah i mean there's there's lots of choices in in life um and like i tell my kids thankfully not every person on earth has elected to become a hunter or fisherman because it would really create an overcrowding situation, but um, it, you know, I'm thankful that that we did get that um, that seed planted, and and we can, you know, we're fortunate in that we're able to have property hunt and and have the time and the financial um, means to to do that. So, you know, going back to a question, you know, what what's the one big thing that you wish you knew when you started archery hunting that you know now that you want to share with the listeners? Uh you know, it, it's a it can be a really complicated um, sport if you make it. But you know what I call it is kind of the evolution of a hunter. You know, we go from our number one goal is to, to kill something, and, and and that's important because that that you know is success. And 
But I think, you know, as you kind of go on through your 30s and 40s, and now I'm into my 50s, me now, like I didn't even draw my bow back last year. I certainly could have shot many, many deer. I passed up some pretty nice bucks. I never even drew my bow last year on a doe or a buck. Um, and I had a great year because I, I saw some things I'd never seen before. I spent, I always take at least two weeks off in the fall and um, I enjoyed every minute of it, even though I didn't harvest anything, didn't draw my bow back. Um, but I always have a video camera in my pocket and I videotape and I get just as much joy out of, you know, going back home and putting it on the computer and, and watching, showing people what I experienced. And, and uh, so it, it's like, say, it's what I kind of refer to as the evolution of a hunter. I think you go from being a killer to just coming down to, it's just the experience of all of it. And, and, you know, it's great when you get something um, to put your tag on, but if you don't, you know what, at least you're not working. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I have to agree, you know, I have, shot a deer i think in four or five years the last one i think i shot was on was on the eddies at the point the point stand it was just a gorgeous high tine buck that tried to buy me and you know that that was really yeah. fun that was just a yeah. fun you know it's a fun you know uh opportunity to take a deer and you know i, mm-hmm. I was really excited because the way he was moving past me and i swung on him like like uh shooting pheasants or a duck and and i just drilled them through both shoulders and you know the whole experience you know met so much and and uh he's in the bunkhouse now just hanging on the wall hanging out because that but that was the last one and uh, yeah you know i i need to shoot eddie wants us to shoot some does i know that yeah oh yeah more more does than you know um that he needs on that on that farm yeah but, you know, uh, there, there's that lake property right next to his, and it, it's just a deer factory because, of course, there's no hunting allowed on it. And yep. So it's a it's, sanctuary. It's a deer factory. Yeah, it's a big sanctuary, is right. And the problem is the, the bigger bucks, and, and your, your um, Garrett killed that 180 a couple of years ago, you know, they came yeah. right off there. You know, just yeah. a gorgeous, wow. gorgeous deer. And there's more of those deer like that, but, you know, they there go are. not they go nocturnal i know you've got some yeah. pictures of big deer also off yeah. your trail cameras and oh, yeah. and they see them but um they know exactly yeah you know you pardon go, yeah go ahead well you know they uh and and that's yeah they it's amazing how these deer can these mature deer can can look at you know it's almost like they have a clock on their on their wall and, and a calendar because you know it seems like as soon as they shed velvet um, they're pretty hard to come by. Uh, you know, that's why even when it's warm on opening weekend, I think it's important to get out there because that's probably your best chance to really, uh, you know, target a specific deer and uh, certainly, you know, maybe get lucky on something else. Um, but I tell you, after that opening weekend, those those mature bucks, um, they get smart in a hurry and, and it, it's pretty darn tough to, to get one after that unless you just spend a lot of time or have some luck on your side. Yeah. I agreed on that, and um, let's switch it up now, and, and let's talk about hunting Buffalo County. I know um, last year we were talking, you know, how long you've been hunting Buffalo County, and I don't quite remember, but I know you do have a place that you've been hunting for so many years, and I'd like mm-hmm. to just get into, you know, hunting Buffalo County because, you know, by all all accounts, you know, Buffalo County is the number one Pope and Young. Uh, in uh, Boone and Crockett County in in the country. And so everybody yeah. knows about Buffalo County. So, you know, right. let's go back to the beginning and, and, and how you found the farm you hunt on. And, and let's talk yeah. about some of the bucks you've taken off it. Yeah. Well, I, a friend of mine actually uh, worked with this farmer's wife and the farm actually was in an outfitting business, but there was some conflict between the outfitter and the farmer because when the outfitter had his hunters out, uh, hunting, um, the farmer would be out trying to, you know, harvest his crop and it didn't, and the hunters and the outfitter didn't like that. And so the outfitter went to the farmer and said, Hey, you know, you can't be out in the fields when I've got hunters out. And, and the farmer was, and I'm not going to use his name, but, um, he was like, well, no, this is how I make my living. I, I, I've got to harvest my crops. And so make a long story short, he pulled the farm out of the outfitting business and, uh, a friend of mine who worked with the farmer's wife, uh, she came to him and said, Hey, I know you're a hunter. Uh, 
would you be interested in in hunting our farm? And um, he was fortunate to have access to a lot of property. Um, and so he came to me as, as a friend and I, I to this day, you know, I, I am thankful and said, hey, would you, you know, be interested in sharing this farm with me? And so we went up and took, took a look at it. And of course, you know, um, the answer was obviously yes. So we hunted together um, for probably three years up there. And then unfortunately, he was killed in an auto accident um, about the third or fourth year that we had it. And, um, you know, it, it was a tough decision to make on one hand because, you know, it, he was the one that got me there. And, but, you know, I sat and talked with the farmer and his wife and my kids at that point were now becoming old enough to hunt with me. Um, and they're like, you know, they, they had young kids and they love my kids. I love their kids. And they're like, you know, we really want, want you to, to stay here. And so, um, so we did. And so it's been myself and my kids for probably six years. I think we've had it about 10 years. Um, and I've taken Jim and Gary, um, up there. Gary shot a pretty nice buck up there the first year he came up. Um, Jim's had some neat, uh, experiences up there with like a decoy. Um, but, um, so, and then, you know, the farmer's kids, they kind of came of age, but Bill is so, or the farmer's so Billy, Billy, um, so busy that, uh, he really didn't have time to introduce his kids to hunting. So I actually took his two oldest kids out for their first hunt. And it was a neat story. We, it was youth season and I, I took the, the daughter out. She had turned 12 and she'd never shot a deer before, never really shot at a deer. And we were sitting over a, a bean field and, um, deer started coming out and I just, you know, she was going to be happy to, to shoot a doe and there were some getting closer. And so we were kind of getting her ready for that. And uh, all of a sudden these three bucks came out of the woods about probably 300 yards away. And I'm like, Oh boy. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm like, Oregon, uh, you know, some deer just came out of the woods and uh, I think, I think they've got horns and she, Oh, I'd really like to shoot one of those. And I'm like, okay, well let's, you know, we've got a little time here. Let's just be patient make a long story short, the biggest buck came about a hundred yards away and she had trouble finding it in the scope. And finally she found it in the scope. And, um, I borrowed her a, a single shot 243. And so she found it in the scope. She's like, yeah, yeah, I, I can see it. You know, I'm, and I'm like, okay, put it right on its shoulder and just squeeze that trigger. And, and she did. And, and she, she shot the buck. Unfortunately, she got scoped in the process and ended up with a nasty cut on her on her bridge of her nose, like we all do at some point in time. But anyway, this buck um, ended up field dressing 243 pounds. Oh my goodness. Um, it didn't, it didn't have a big rack. I think it would have grossed in those one thirties. Um, but it was the biggest body deer I'd ever seen in my life. We walked up to that thing and I'm like, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I just never seen anything close to that. And so we, we um, took care of it that night, hung it in the, in the shed. And then after school the next day, her dad took her into town with that buck. So it was actually 24 hours after she shot it, that thing field dressed 243 pounds. <laughs> so pretty neat story. That's one of the, you know, one of the things that, that I'll never forget. You know, the, just the experience of hunting with her and talking with her and then her hunting and shooting that deer and getting scoped. I mean, she fell back off her chair and she was kind of laying on the ground. We were in a ground blind. She was laying there kind of dazed didn't really know what happened and I'm trying to keep an eye on the buck and and it ran maybe 20 25 yards and stood there for a few seconds and then dropped over <laughs> it was just she didn't need stitches did she no no she didn't it didn't cut her deep but it it gave her a pretty nasty, uh, <laughs> oh. half moon you know oh. like I say we've all been there we've oh yeah we've all done that once and uh I, I felt kind of bad but she was she, she was just speechless she just didn't you know first off she didn't realize she actually hit the deer and I, I, you know, so, so neat experience. Yeah. I've got some great memories up there. Um, now, how do you hunt Buffalo County? What, what's, what's your technique to making sure those, those mature bucks, you know, um, don't know you there. Yeah. It's all about limiting your imprint and the, the farm is about 500 acres, which sounds huge, but it only, there's only, there's less than a hundred acres of woods on it. And it's kind of, maybe three or four little pieces. So, you know, I, I don't have any stands in the interior of those woods. Everything is on the, on the outside of it. Um, and you basically just got to try to play the wind direction 
So again, I'll go up there opening weekend and hunt for a couple evenings. I don't hunt in the mornings. Uh, hunt a couple evenings just to kind of see what's around. Maybe, you know, like say, I think opening weekend's a great chance to, to kill one of those big mature bucks. But then after opening weekend, I lay really low. Um, I'll go up there maybe once a week for an evening. And I've got a couple of stands that I call observation stands. I, you know, they're out in pastures where um, I can just see the farm pretty well. Um, I don't really go up there with the intention of being able to shoot anything, but it just kind of, you know, kind of keep an eye on things, see what's around, um, kind of see if the deer are, are coming out in different spots or whatever. And then usually about the 20th of October is when I really start getting pictures, daylight pictures of mature bucks. Um, and it'll start out with the two and a half year olds and then you'll, you know, you'll start catching some three and a half. Um, and usually around the 25th of October, if the weather's cool, um, is when, you know, I'll start getting, you know, the really mature deer. Um, but it's a short window. I'll tell you what, because, you know, I think in my opinion, and I'm not an expert by any means, but in my opinion, some does, mature does will start coming into estrus, you know, right around that 22nd to 25th. And, and of course, those biggest mature bucks are the ones that lock down with them first. And I just, I, in fact, this this year, I moved my vacation up a week. Um, I usually used to take the last week of October, first week of November off. And I actually moved my vacation up, so I'm off starting about the 20th of October. Um, because I think once those big bucks lock down, it gets really tough. And when, the, you know, they say, well, you know, when they're between does, I think when they're between does is at night. And they hook up with another doe, and then they're back on lockdown. So that that's just me. Again, I'm not an expert. I, I spend a lot of time out there, and I do a lot of reading. Um, but um, yeah, that's um, that, that's kind of my approach is just low impact until the time is right, and then you go to your best stand. Uh, you know, I I've got a handful of stands up there that are my go-to stands, and I leave them alone until the time is right, and then I just go in. And I used to be able to do all day sits. I can't do that anymore. I've got a kind of a bad back. And so I usually try to sit till noon or maybe one o'clock and then I'll go back, take a quick break, and then maybe go to a field edge stand or something for the rest of the day. But, um, you know, it, it's just all about low impact with those big mature deer. Now, thinking about your trail camera setup, how many trail cameras do you run on those 100 acres? Um, up, well, up there, I only have a couple because Bill pastures. Um, you know, he really farms the, the farm hard. So, I mean, even most of the woods get pastured in the summertime. And so, you know, the cattle love those cameras. They love to mess them up. And so I've only really got two spots up there that are in woods that are protected by fences so the cattle can't get in there. So I, I only run a couple up there. Um, there's, there's a nice creek that runs through there. And I, obviously, I know the deer are using that creek, but again, the cattle have access to it. And so I, I just only run a couple up there. Um, and, uh, you know, up until this year, I, I was using some mineral, but, um, you know, it's, it's not legal this year. So, but unfortunately, or fortunately, those sites have been established for a few years. And so they're, they're still working those areas pretty hard. Uh, you know, there's a lot of mineral in the, in the soil yet. So, so they've got some pretty good holes dug there. So I was thinking before you said you had a creek running through it, um, do you yeah. have any, you know, um, water holes or, you know, uh, for the deer that you built or the, the farmer has? No, um, not really. Um, it's just the, kind of the way the farm sets up. There, there is one pond on it, um, good sized pond, but it's kind of out in a, in a pastured area. So I'm, I'm sure the deer use it, uh, but I'm it's pretty much at night, I'm sure, because it's fairly exposed. Um, but, in, you know, now that uh, season starts, I'll start making some mock scrapes, and I put my cameras over those mock scrapes, um, and, and that's kind of where my cameras will stay until I'm done with them for the year. So with your mock scrapes, um, are you using a, a, a rubbing post and a licking branch, or are you just uh, putting a dripper of, above it? No, I actually, you know, again, this is kind of a home concoction. I'm not an expert, but this is what works for me. Um you always got to have a licking branch. Um, but when I, I go in with rubber boots, rubber gloves, when I, when I establish it, you know, make a nice, you know, good size uh, scrape area. And then I urinate in it. And every time I can get close to those scrapes, I urinate in them. And that's the only scent that I use. And I know some people will say, you know, I'm a kook, but I can tell you that that is very effective. Um, I, 
Why? What's that? Why? Is, what? It, is it is it the salt in your urine, or what do you think it is? That's no. I think I've it, heard that before. I'm just asking. It's a, it's a curiosity thing. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of sense. Uh, you know, a lot of urine out in the woods for these deer, and and so I think you know some people say human urine. Well, yeah, it's human urine, but it's urine, and it's you know it's fresh and it's pure. And you know, I have never had a deer. You know, I, I'm one of these that I don't take a, a bottle with me into the stand. Um, I just go right from my stand, and I've had deer not want to leave, you know, because they're so curious about that, that scent. And so I don't hesitate um, to, to use what, what nature gave us. Um, it's sure a lot cheaper than what you can buy in the stores. And, Heck yeah. Uh, it's just very, very effective. Um, so, yeah, you got to have a licking branch. Um, and, and I've kind of got some areas, some traditional scrape areas um, that I just kind of reopen every year um, and get a camera on them. And uh, I get some great pictures doing it that way. Now, what's the largest buck you ever got on, on the trail camera? Um, there was a buck up there that we had nicknamed Tenor because uh, he was just a perfect 10 um, from about age three and a half up to six and a half. And just a beautiful, tall, not super wide, maybe had an 18 inch inside spread, but uh, G2s, G3s that were over a foot. Um, when he was seven and a half, then he grew two more points. Um, we still called him Kenner, even though he was a 12 pointer, but you know, he was, he was a boon, boon and crockett deer. He was somewhere in the one seventies, might've pushed 180 as a typical giant deer. Um, I only saw Kenner one time in the flesh. Um, it was, I had been to a stand, it was early October and the, and the wind had switched and I got picked off, uh, by a couple lesser deer and i'm like i'm out of here so i left got out of there went down to where my camper was at but i could still see this field um and so i was just down there chilling um you know kind of keeping an eye on the field and probably a good i mean the sun was still well out good hour before it got dark Kenner came out of the woods now had i been there he would have busted me long before he came out of the woods um but that was the only time i actually saw that deer in the flesh but I have thousands of pictures of him. Um, he was, as soon as I would put mineral out in the spring, I'd put it out during turkey season. He'd be the first buck on that, on that uh, mineral. And he was not camera shy. I mean, he, I think he kind of grew up around cameras and he, he was, he would pose, I mean, just a beautiful deer. So that was when he was seven and a half. Um, that next January, after he shed his antlers, uh, he was taken with a ag tag uh, with a rifle in January with an egg tag. So that was the end of tenor. Um, but he was a booner. He was, he was a giant deer, um, just beautiful, beautiful deer. So what's an egg tag? Um, well, it's farmers can apply for them. Um, and they can shoot antlerless deer year round with those egg tags. And, at, you know, at the time there was a lot of deer up there and, and the, the farmers in the area were, were getting these egg tags and they, they were having sharpshooters come in. They were doing whatever they could do to, to cut down on the numbers of deer. Because, you know, in Buffalo County, there's there's a ton of quality management. There's a ton of outfitting. And so most, not most, but a lot of people go up there for horns. And so there's not enough does shot. And so the farmer's answer to that is then they get these ag tags for free through the, through the you know, uh, state. And they can shoot, you know, it's, it's not unheard of for some of these guys to get 20, 25 ag tags a year and, um, and they'll just shoot antlerless deer. Well, as you know, starting in December and well into January, obviously, especially these mature bucks, I think are, are dropping their antlers. And so, you know, they come out of the woods at, at dusk um, and they get popped with a rifle. And uh, yeah, so I, I know for a fact that, uh, that, that tenor was killed uh, that way. Did you ever find any of his sheds? No, no, I don't think, yeah, I think what he would do, he he would he was on the neighboring property because it was lightly hunted, um, recently um, logged, and it was really thick. And so I think that was where he was doing most of his bedding. Um, but he would come over to you know for the crops and for this mineral. And so I I would get lots and lots of pictures of him. Um, but I think daylight he was he was on this neighboring property where there was very very little hunting um, pressure and he. He was, you know, at a nice sanctuary there. Um, so no, I would, 
was never able to find his shed um, because I'm, I'm sure they were in that uh, in that sanctuary area. So, what about this fall? What's on your hit list? It's September 11th. I'm, I mean, yeah, yeah it's 9/11. Yeah, you know, it, it's been kind of a weird year. I, I'm I've been behind on everything. We we bought this new house and I mow like two and a half, three acres, and so that takes up a lot of time. Oh my goodness! Uh, doing that, so I, I just I'm behind on everything. And then once we drew these elk tags, um, that really kind of became my focus. So I, I'm going to hunt this coming weekend a little bit, um, but I'm really just you know focused and geared up for this elk hunt. You know, once we get back from that, then I'll obviously switch gears and kind of go back into whitetail mode. Um, and, and again, I've got a couple weeks uh, off uh, in October, early November, so. You know, I'll get some quality sits in, but at least for now, I'm just, you know, just really focused on this health fund. So. Well, I wish, I wish you well on that, and I can't wait to, yeah. you know, have a beer with you at Fishies or Romedy House. Yeah. I'm, I'm not hunting Buffalo County, um, okay, um, but I'm, I'm going to be going up through there. I'm going to hunt, hunt up by uh, Birch with my, my friend's farm up there, where, okay. um, they had that nice ten pointer, and nobody got them, so we okay. have. You don't have trail cameras yet, but you know yeah. he's he's a wonderful mature deer, that's for sure. So then I'm yeah. hunting Minnesota, and I'll be hunting Nebraska. So I'm hunting three states right now, um, nice. and so I've got a busy I've got a busy October and November. Yeah. But I should be up. Yeah. I I'll be in your country, uh, you know, just about the whole month of November. Well, not just about. I plan to be there from Halloween, you know, forward someplace in Wisconsin. Sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, hunting. Okay. So, well, I, yeah. I can't wait to connect. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that'll be great. Hopefully, yeah. we'll have some, some stories to tell and pick well, I ho- share. Yeah, I hope you guys score in your elk. I know you've waited a number of years to get it. And, um, it's been yeah. a tough. It's been a tough year, as far as I know. Um, the place that I hunt, um, they were in there. The the elk were in the basin, uh, open weekend, and then they just disappeared. And I'm not even yeah. going to hunt again because I called the local that I hunt with and he goes, Bruce, they're not here. We can't find them. So don't, mm-hmm. don't come because we won't yeah. be hunting here. And sure. that's what happens, you know, in, in elk hunting. But Marv, it's just been a joy to have you on, on the show. And I can't wait yeah. to catch up and, and share some stories, um, you know, in a, in a month or two. And, um, you know, look forward to some pictures. Oh yeah. Just send me a grip and grin. So when I post this, I've got some pictures of you. You bet. I will do that. You bet. Well, sir, thank you so much and safe travels. And I can't wait to connect with you uh, in a couple of months. All right. That sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.